Welcome to episode 211 of Your Career Podcast. Welcome to Your Career Podcast. I'm Jane Jackson, and you'll find I'm on a mission to make careers guidance, inspiration, and advice available to you anytime you need it. Now, today, I have an incredibly talented guest on the show, Simon Banks, who is an author and international speaker on creativity and innovation. Before we launch into our interview, if you're on Clubhouse, the new digital platform, follow me at Jane Jackson, that's my handle or username, as I host regular chat rooms on career management and LinkedIn tips where you can ask me questions on the spot. Clubhouse, if you don't know, is where podcasting meets talkback radio, which means you can listen and join in the conversation in real time. So Mondays at 7 p.m. Sydney time is when I go live for Q&A on anything you want to ask me about your career. Look for the link with more information about Clubhouse and how to get to my room in my show notes. Now, on with the show. Simon Banks is an author and international speaker on creativity and innovation and is a happily recovering artist. He describes his geek out spot as the intersection of creativity and design, learning, people and passion, which he sees as essential building blocks for future leaders and developing an innovative culture. His big why? to build a more creative world to enable people and business to thrive in the modern age. Simon has facilitated over 1,300 successful events across Europe, Asia, America, and Australia, including conferences, innovation hackathons, visual storytelling programs, and creativity and design thinking workshops. He's worked to bring fresh thinking and innovation out of teams and companies that include Ernst & Young, Chevron, the Australian Department of Industry, Innovation and Science, Sportsbet, Suncorp, NAB, Commonwealth Bank, and more. Now, Simon lives and breathes creativity. He's also a talented professional artist, has lectured at the National Gallery of England, and developed programs for institutions such as the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney. He is the author of A Thousand Little Light Bulbs, How to Kickstart a Culture of Innovation in Your Organization. And let's welcome Simon to the show. Hello, Simon. Yeah, good morning and glad to be welcomed. <laughs> I, I was really excited to have you on the show because I found you on LinkedIn, even though we kind of, you know, knew each other's names for a while. But you had a post that went absolutely viral and reached out to you. And then I found out your interesting career path. And so, you know, with, with your wonderful work in innovation and creativity and design now, let's wind all the way back. And just to kick us off, what were your early aspirations when you were a little boy? That's a really good and deep question. My earliest memory was wanting to be an actor. I was always a bit of a show off and a little bit of a smart ass and sort of like to be up in front of people. So I thought I really like to get into acting. I, I remember talking to my mum around it and, and she gave the obvious, well, look, acting's, you know, quite hard to have a career out of. And then I remember seeing my art teacher and PE teacher at school and I thought, well, they seem to have a pretty cruisy life. They just sort of rock in and a bit of sport and a lot of art and I thought well that might be a good thing to do and that's uh, maybe that's about as much thought as I as I put into it it was more based on well they have a pretty good lifestyle I wouldn't mind some of that mm, so that's what that's what your driver is the lifestyle <laughs> I've always been very good on the work lifestyle balance heavily lean towards the lifestyle maybe a little too strong mm. however I what's the point of what's the point of working if you can't enjoy yourself Exactly. And you know what? We work 90,000 hours on average in our lifetime. If you're going to spend that many hours working, it may as well be enjoyable, yes? Yeah. And you always say no one lies on their deathbed thinking, I wish I had have worked a little harder. That's generally, from, from what I understand, <laughs> I wish I had a, uh, had a little bit more of a good time. 
Yeah, and it sounds like you've had a really good time because you started your career as a teacher teaching art and PE and special education, and then you moved through quite a number of roles, and they've all been quite different. So from teaching art and PE, you transitioned into marketing and events and account management before becoming a lecturer at the National Gallery of England and then curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art before we get into your business now. And we'll talk about that in a little while. But so how did you make these transitions? Because going from teacher, art and PE into marketing and events, what, what, what was your thinking and how did you make that transition? That's a re- really good question. And I guess when I did the teaching for four years, I really enjoyed it at the time. One, because it gave me a lot of spare time to pursue my own professional arts career. And I left university and sort of teaching was my side hustle for my art. And so I would spend every living moment uh, painting. And the art was, oh, so the teaching was always a bit of a side hustle to the art. And then I always thought, well, maybe I don't want to be an artist full time because you're a bit like a Trappist monk in your studio. And I really like speaking and connecting with people. So I also had a a side hustle doing marketing events for a friend who would put on big dance events and dance parties. And I thought, I really like this side of things. And then I thought, well, I've had enough of teaching after four years. Why don't I try something else? And on the basis of a personality, when I moved to the UK, the basis of personality alone, I got a job with a sort of pretty big corporate training, learning and development leadership company in the UK and that's where my new career kicked off and I guess to some extent I've I've kept in with that since then. Mm, Yeah I mean it it really is quite incredible and then you were lecturing at the National Gallery of England which would be very interesting. that, that, That was the next step and look after doing after doing this sort of more corporate career for two or three years and also I'm sort of quite ashamed to say but I was really I really hid that artistic creative side when I joined I thought, oh, I need to be quite serious and, you know, sort of leave that, uh, you know, bum, surfy artist, which I was to some extent, (laughs) leave that behind and be a bit more suited and booted. And I found I didn't really enjoy not having that creative uh, creative part in my life, especially in my working life, even though I was still exhibiting at night but sort of suit by day. And I had a discussion with my boss and said, you know, I'd like to, you know, do something else. And then he said, well, yeah, sure. But then on the same day, he said, how about you hang on to all your clients and just work for us on a more casual basis rather than full time, which left me free to do other things. And so I got a job, yeah, talking about the one of the greatest collections of Western art in the world at the National Gallery of England. So I had a, a foot in both camps and that's when I thought, yeah, this is, this is pretty cool, this setup. And that was the start of my, you know, you might call it my freelancing career, which has continued on to this day. I'm never having a, a full-time job since then. But you know what, following your passion this way, and so you tried corporate, it wasn't really for you. It was okay for a little while, but not really full-time. But immersing yourself in everything that's creative and artistic and even art history, it it really shows where your passion lies. And now, fast forward many years, and you run your own business as a creative training director, and you're a keynote speaker, you speak on innovation and design. Tell us about your your business at the moment, because what you do to me is so fascinating, because first of all, you're following your passion. And secondly, it's so creative, and really, it, it's, it's different. So share with the listeners how how your business works yeah that's a good uh, another I keep saying that's another good question which is good so <laughs> you're very good at this <laughs> at the moment when people ask what do you do I say I'm a keynote speaker and author on creativity and innovation and also a recovering artist and look in the industry I'm known for my high energy design sprints training days and workshops online and offline now that Uh, really shift the way that people think and help them develop great products, services and ideas. And I guess my my geek out spot is that intersection of creativity and design, learning, people and passion. Because I think when you have those four things, they're great building blocks for a culture of innovation. 
And that's what I always like to any client I work with, how do you build that culture into your organisation? So it moves from, oh, we have an innovation team to innovation, and I call that change which adds value. How do we create that change which adds value mindset across the organisation? And so everyone's excited about this wonderful, curious, creative, imaginative potential that we have rather than poo-hooing it and calling ourselves uncreative as so many people do. Mm, yeah, I, I think so many people do say, because I've heard others say it, that, oh, I'm, I'm no good at creativity. I'm not a creative person. But I believe everyone can be creative, can't they? They just, they, they're sort of conditioned to think in a certain way. And if through your methodologies, people can break free and get more creative, that really enhances their careers and their lives too. Yeah, and creativity is listed by almost every global survey from PwC to KPMG to the World Economic Forum, LinkedIn, uh, the most, the number one needed skill to thrive in the workforce of 2020 and beyond. I guess if uh, COVID showed us one thing, uh, you know, we, we need different thinking to to work our way out of the situation we're in. You know, productivity will only get us so far. So I like to think at the moment, you know, creativity is the new productivity. Mm. Yeah, you know, you know, right now, I mean, because the world is experiencing so many challenges due to COVID and businesses are closing down, there are redundancies and unemployment is, is soaring. I mean, just, just in Australia, it's, it's almost a million people unemployed now and they're predicting by December it might be two. And then in, in America, oh, my goodness, the numbers are just, just mind-boggling. Um, businesses need to get really creative as to how they can and i hate to say the way of pivot because everyone's talking about pivoting at the moment but how how to make a change and how to stay in business so if you were going to go into an organization and help them to think differently or think innovatively what's your process how how, how does your day go well, there's, uh, there's no one set way per se because almost every time you go into an organisation, their needs are a little bit different. So it's not so much a cookie-cutter approach. But the big things I always get people to deal with, which are, are universal or to work with, is deal with their creative ogre, which tells them how creatively crap they are and generally connected to their ability to draw something realistic and have sort of hung on to the I'm not creative energy uh, all of their life since that moment in high school. I then get them to get rid of the the nose and the butts in their language and use a different type of language when they hear and listen uh, for ideas and give feedback. So all of a sudden you've got rid of that voice inside saying you can't and you've all of a sudden you've changed that response or those voices that where people tell other people you can't or that's a stupid idea or let's all have a laugh. And if, as Australians, we all love to laugh at each other's ideas because that's our way. And then there's a number of different processes, but if we did something along the lines of a design sprint, which I do a lot with uh, clients, where we'll use rapid things like rapid testing and rapid prototyping and deep diving to understanding our customers and testing our ideas with them at speed. We go through a way where we empathise with our customer, like we go out and interview them, we understand them, we observe them. We then make sure we're asking really great questions to make sure we might be solving the right problem. As an example, it might be we're all thinking around, well, how do we bring people back into work and keep them distanced? which is a question of space, whereas a better question might be how do we keep people connected and feel valued and loved in this sparse office environment where there's only six people at a time and they're not allowed to go near each other. So make sure we ask the right questions and then make sure we take our thinking really wide and come up with as many ideas as we can. And then let's build some of those ideas in a really rough and ready format and let's go out and test them and get some feedback. And when we say test, it's not going to people, hey, do you like what I presented? It's actually giving it to them, just watching, observing and see what comes back. And that's a process that can repeat really successfully and help you do a huge amount in a short amount of time. Mm, just listening to you explaining that makes me feel excited I want to go and have a brainstorming session with you as well and have some design sprint because I think 
being able to to hear everybody's ideas and let them know that they're in a safe space so that no one's going to laugh at them um, too much anyway. Uh, but but you know, just to be able to test different ideas must be so empowering and they must feel very free during your sessions because I, I know that what, what you do also is you don't just talk about things and give people manuals and lists you you as an illustrator as well you you illustrate your point to make it even more powerful yes yeah absolutely because when we write stuff down we activate a very linear part of our brain or a very narrow part of our brain when we uh, visualize things and you know visual thinking is our most dominant sense and about 50 percent of our brains evolved in visual processing when we visualize things it's really easy to see them obviously because they're visualized so we go from having to think a lot harder than we need to if you draw a picture and say is that what you're thinking is this what uh does this represent your thoughts it's really easy for people to engage with quickly and one of the most important things when you're doing anything creative because you know brainstorming gets a really bad rap because we've all had a session from hell where <laughs> someone goes hey let's brainstorm be crazy and we're all you know the, the, all, the eyes roll across the world when that's said uh, there are we all think differently we all process information differently we all express our thoughts differently so you need to provide multiple ways for people to engage in that creative process and you spoke around uh, I think you mentioned around that sort of psychological safety mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the most important things. And there's a term creative confidence because we're all creative. We breathe, walk, talk, create, except we seem to drop the creativity bit. Um, but if you've got that creative confidence, uh, once you've got that, things become possible. So not about being creative is just about having that creative confidence to mm. express your thoughts and ideas and try things a little bit out of our comfort zone and when that kicks off oh, it's fantastic I love it mm. you'll never see more energy in a room a space or in wherever you may be running this when people that creative confidence kicks in and you realize what you can achieve in a short amount of time once we access that amazing part of our brain and heart and soul that we we might have ignored for all too long yeah, you know, it, it, it reminds me of a time of many years ago, I, I was feeling really stuck in, in a certain aspect of my life. And I went on this, this course, it was called the journey. And part of the journey, there was a bit of meditation and, you know, relaxing. And you talked about the creative ogre. And I had the creative ogre, because I, I mentioned just before we started the podcast that many, many years ago, I, my original degree was in graphic design and technical illustration so I thought I was really good at drawing but it was the realistic drawing creating something that looked like what it actually is which is pretty boring actually but I, one of the tasks that we had to do in this this journey in this course was to start to draw just just to draw anything we were told just draw anything of what was going on in your life and everyone didn't really know how to draw and I was feeling a bit superior thinking haha I can draw and it looks like the real thing and I started drawing I was taking so long everyone was getting really bored because it had to be perfect and I had this perfectionism thing going on with me and I was drawing and everyone's rolling their eyes and it's like Jane will you finish and hurry up and when when they all looked at each other's pictures everyone was just like colors and splashes and all sorts of squiggles and I thought what's that don't even know what it is but they were happier where Whereas for me, I was obsessing over, oh, that doesn't look like an eye and that doesn't look like a hand and everything. And the instructor said, Jane, you are so stuck. You are so stuck in yourself. And it was true. And I just couldn't see a way out of it. And then finally she goes, Jane, just stop it. Just draw. Don't worry about perfection. And then I ended up with lots of colors and all sorts of just crazy things. But then my mind was relaxing and I actually came up with the, my own solution to my problem because it came out that what was holding me back was this really big thing that ended up being just a big black blob on, on, the, on the, uh, the drawing board that I was drawing on. What do you think of that? That's, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, well, once we start to once we start to express our thoughts in different ways, and it might be journaling, it might be through any different activity which takes makes us start to think differently. Yeah, absolutely, things start to change. And it's funny that you mentioned drawing, because I do a lot of right, I do a lot of work with my clients where I'll teach them how to sketch their thoughts out in a short amount of time. So then, for the rest of the day, we'll we'll all spend time visualizing what 
you know, a strategy looks like, but they all contribute as well. So it's not just me. But if you want to see people, um, I guess, see the fear of God, commend them and all the colour disappear from their face, say, I'd like you to draw something. People <laughs> are horrified by that. And, you know, they'll walk over hot coals or jump off a pole and grab onto a rope. And the moment you say draw, people are absolutely horrified. But once you actually realise there's a few a few little techniques and once you loosen up a little bit and worry, don't worry about, about so much what it will, will look like, it's actually really good and it's enjoyable. And that's why things like um, you know, journaling are really popular. Adult colouring books are really popular because they provide a bit of that sort of that gateway to expressing your thoughts and doing something creative. And look, we all have a creative soul mm. and we feel good when we, we make something. We feel good mm. to cre- create, build, design, whatever that is. But anything where we're doing something with our, our hands or our voice or our feet or which is a little bit different, we, we feel great. Yeah, yeah, I know. I I love dance. That's that's my expression, um, and I enjoy it. And I feel so happy when I'm doing it yeah. as well. So, Simon, tell me, you're you're the director of this business, Visual Funk. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and and what you do and how you help? Well, look, Visual Funk is a little bit of an extension of all the other things that I do, and it's changed. It's changed dramatically since I started it. And look, originally, I it was the name of an exhibition I did with a friend of mine and at the time we're really into sort of funk music and dance music and so it was sort of heavily influenced by well what if that dance music and that funk music turned into art what would it look like so that was the name of an exhibition and I've just kept it and look when I uh, returned back from the UK I had all these different ideas around how to use these sort of art-based skills and then bring them to life and and I sort of created all these sort of weird and wonderful programs. I think they're a bit weird, too weird and wonderful. I didn't do any sort of client research. <laughs> <laughs> and people are like, well, what do you mean experiential creativity? And, and, and then I just changed the name of all of those things to team building. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden everyone goes, oh, I get what this is. So for a, a, a long time, a long time, it was a creative team events company. However, I, you know, like anything, you're a little bit bored with that. And then to a large extent now, it's, a, it's another extension of what I do. So we run innovation workshops, we run design sprints, but very heavily influenced by a visual approach. I've got a really great team of illustrators and artists and people who've got, had a career sort of bringing ideas to life visually. So we do a huge amount of work with clients where we visualise their strategies, might visualise their stories we might do rapid prototyping with them design new products and services but very much jumping in on that visual approach and I think that's sort of where we'll, we'll stay as well because that seems to be a nice sort of niche and it leaves me free to do a lot more speaking and all the other things that I like to chase as well. Mm. And you know what comes across so strongly is that you have this huge amount of fun with what you do because you do what you like, you do what you enjoy, and you're helping people as well, and you're you're enabling people to to improve their businesses and improve their lives and careers and gain greater satisfaction from it, which which I think is is a wonderful thing. And also there's there's like a happiness about what you do. And I think right now with everything that the world's going through with COVID, et cetera, we need, we need a bit more happiness. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And I always say to people, look, if you find yourself having a good time today, don't be alarmed. Uh, that's quite <laughs> natural when we, when we start to do things a little bit differently. Once you get, as I said, that creative confidence, a little bit of fun and energy in the day. And look, it doesn't mean you're not doing serious things because you're getting paid to be there to, to solve problems. But if you if you can leave the day feeling a little bit sort of happier in yourself as well, or days a little bit happier in yourself, um, yeah, absolutely. And I guess when I think around, we all have our, our big why or purpose, minds to build a more creative world to enable people and businesses to thrive and live well in the modern age. Because I think it's not only creativity and let's call that connecting the dots in different ways. Creative is not only good for your business, it's really good for you because it means more options, means doing some, starting your bucket list a little bit early, not waiting till you retire, um, you know, more interesting things with your family and your life and, you know, just being open to more possibilities. Mm. And if we're a little bit more curious along the way as well, we start to, to notice new things in the world around us and that can only be a good thing. 
Mm. Oh, I feel so much joy just talking to you. It's oh, really good. nice. Thank because you. Because it's, it's, it's I'm, honestly, I, I just, I think of you as Mr. Happy. That's wonderful. To build a more creative world to enable people to thrive. I love that. And you know what, Simon? On LinkedIn, if you go to your app on LinkedIn, there is a voice feature that you can use now. I don't know if you've activated it yet. I did um, not know that. But I've been telling people about it since, you know, I'm a LinkedIn trainer as well as a career coach. But if you activate it, you get 10 seconds to pronounce your name because the, the whole point of it was really so people would know how to pronounce your name. Simon Banks is not hard, but you've got another nine seconds after saying Simon Banks in one second to tell people how how you work. And um, I, I think you'd, you'd enjoy that and have a bit of creative fun with the voice. Yeah, feature. absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you told me that. I didn't know yeah. about that. And, you know, yeah. I do like to talk. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's benefiting me in a few don't, different ways. Don't we both? That's right. But um, and I always love to give LinkedIn tips as well. So now I'm going to have on my show notes at janejacksoncoach.com the, uh, the links so that people can find you. But I can tell everybody now they can find Simon at Simon simonbanks.com.au and are there any other places where you would like to be found yeah as a good business person i spend more time on linkedin than other social channels so first name simon banks last name keynote speaker i share a bunch of that stuff as you, i share a bunch of stuff regularly and do a lot of giveaways for um, different products on linkedin uh, you can also connect on instagram simon banks c r e a number eight, which I'm relatively or active on there. And same handle on Twitter, which I check maybe once a week. So <laughs> LinkedIn <laughs> and Instagram are my two choices. Lovely. Simon Banks, C-R-E-A-8. So Simon yes. Banks Create. How fantastic yes. is that? I like that. Well, thank you so much for your time, Simon. I yeah, really appreciate it. I'm on. sure this is going to be a really, really fun episode for everybody. And um, I look forward to viewing more of your your incredible creative creations <laughs> on LinkedIn as well. And um, look, if we do show notes or something, mm -hmm. we can put a link in that where they can download that day planner, yes, which yes. you liked and everyone else liked. Mm, so it's yeah, a nice well, that's, way to that's how I found you, found you in the first place. I just saw this incredible planner and it was so simple yet so effective. And I think that's the thing with innovation and creativity. Don't make it complicated, but make it effective. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, Simon. It was a real pleasure to have you on your career podcast and we'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, look forward to it. If you enjoy your career podcast, please hop over to iTunes and leave a review because that's how we get to reach more people. And if you need help in your career, go to www.thecareersacademy.online where you'll be able to find lots of online programs as well as one-on-one -on -one coaching with me. See you soon.